Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Economist Corporate Network event live from Singapore. My name is Andy Staples. I'm the editorial director of the Economist Corporate Network. Um, today, our theme is looking at talent, tech, uh, and transformation. And I'm delighted to be joined by uh, a number of speakers who are going to be sharing their insights and expertise uh, on this th theme as well. Um, just in terms of uh, format uh, for this morning, we have three key sections uh, uh, to go through over the next sort of hour and a half or so. Uh, I'm going to be sharing some of the key findings of a new paper that we're releasing today, uh, and then we'll be moving into a panel discussion. Uh, in the final section, uh, I'll be joined by a further speaker who's dialing in from uh, Kuala Lumpur, and we'll have a few minutes uh, of uh, comment and, and reflection on the discussion that we're going to have this morning, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Um, just to bring your attention to Slido, uh, and you can see the details there up on your screen, please go to slido.com and enter those details. You'll be able to see a short poll there. We've got four questions uh, to ask you, and, and uh, um, very happy if you could fill those in for us uh, as we're going through over the next few minutes. We'll come back to look at those results uh, a little bit later on. You can also use the Slido platform to send in any questions and comments that you might have to our panel and to, to myself as well. Um, as ever, we'd like to make this as uh, interactive as possible. So please do think about questions as we go through the morning uh, and send them through. So let me just um, get us underway. And hopefully you can see on your screen there um, some shots of papers that we've been doing over the years. We, we generally turned this to the, the talent project, which we kicked off about uh, six years ago. And every year we've taken the opportunity to survey all of our members, all of you uh, across Asia, um, on themes related to talent uh, and technology. And, and most importantly, we really wanted to talk to business leaders to get their sense from their perspectives, running businesses uh, about issues related to talent, talent development, technology, uh, and so on. So you can see a number of the papers that we've done uh, over the years. Uh, and over the past couple of years, we focused a lot more on uh, issues related to the future of works, so AI, uh, automation, uh, and so on. Uh, and this last paper uh, that we're releasing today, Talent, Tech, and Transformation, really focuses in, I think, uh, takes some of the things that we've been looking at over the past few years and brings them, bring them together uh, in, in one place as well. Uh, I should also note that we ran this survey, many of you will recall doing this survey, uh, back um, uh, in March of this year, or uh, end, end of February, actually, is when we, we ran the survey. Uh, and uh, as you all know, uh, that was just prior to everything shutting down as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So uh, uh, two points there. One is that it's a really interesting snapshot of how people uh, were thinking about these issues just before uh, we had the whole crisis. Uh, and secondly, uh, it's an opportunity today to come back and revisit those issues, particularly through discussion with our guests here in the studio uh, about what's changed over the last three months and how that's um, uh, going to impact and shape uh, business operations going forward as well. So um, I'm just going to go through a few slides, which are basically drawing some graphics from uh, the paper itself. But just before we get there, these are the sort of guiding questions that we had uh, to, um, uh, for the paper itself, uh, for the survey, and the follow-up interviews that we did with people. We really wanted to sort of dig into this issue of how future-ready you feel that your workforce is. We wanted to look at the skills uh, requirements, skills gaps, how you're filling those gaps as well, uh, what you're doing with your existing workforce, uh, how you're rejuvenating your existing workforce through training and development, for example. And there's a final section looking at how you as business leaders are actually leading this transformation, or are you? Are you delegating that to somebody else uh, in the organization as well? So those are the sort of uh, key themes that we wanted to uh, have a look at. Uh, and let me take you through uh, some of the key uh, findings now. So this first chart that we have up here, I think just sort of sets the scheme a, a, a little bit. Um, we wanted to, to know what's driving your digital transformation. What are the uh, key reasons for you to undertake this type of uh, journey? Uh, and as you'll be able to see there on the left-hand side, uh, to remain competitive, uh, to drive innovation within uh, uh, the organization are the key drivers. And interestingly, if you go right across to the other side of the, uh, the screen, uh, reducing costs seems to be much less important. So that's, that's an interesting one because we hear a lot about people uh, um, implementing technology to save labor, to reduce costs and so on. Uh, but our survey is telling us that that's less important. So something that we can come back to a little bit later on. 
The next um, slide that you'll see here, there's two graphics on here, and this is um, really uh, starting to get into uh, perceptions or, or, or how confident you feel uh, your workforce is at the moment. So the top one here, we asked the question, uh, I, could con uh, I could confidently describe my workforce as future ready. Uh, and what we have here is um, a majority, so just under 60% uh, of people agreeing with that statement. But you'll see in that top bar there, only 6.6% .6 of respondents could strongly agree to this. Uh, and this may be something uh, uh, that we'll come back to as we go through these next few slides and, and the discussion this morning. Uh, it seems that that's a relatively low degree of confidence in the workforce that you have at the moment. And so what steps are you taking uh, to, to, to improve that? And if you look at the second bar at the, at the bottom of the screen there, we'll be looking at um, uh, in terms of where you are on that journey of developing a future ready workforce. In other words, a workforce that's ready and able uh, to utilize all the tools and technologies that are, uh, that are available on the market uh, to help you rebuild uh, your organization and take it forward. Um, and so we asked this question a few years ago uh, as well in terms of uh, where people sit uh, on a curve. 17% uh, there saying that they uh, are uh, ahead of the curve, um, just under half, 44% saying that they're uh, keeping up with peers. But then you've got just over a third, just under 40% actually, who are uh, at a relatively early stage on this. And it's interesting to see how this changes uh, over, uh, over the years. And if you dig in uh, to uh, uh, some of the reasons why people think that they're ahead of the curves, of course, we see a lot of the tech companies uh, in that component there and financial services, for example. Uh, and as we move towards the right of the screen there, uh, you get some uh, companies in, in some of them in more traditional sectors uh, with legacy systems, for example, that are, are taking a bit uh, 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 longer to affect that change. As I move on to uh, the next slide here, um, uh, this is looking at a uh, uh, degree of confidence uh, in terms of um, uh, the workforce that you have today and allowing you as the business leader to deliver on strategy. So you can see that, uh, that curve there uh, with about half of the respondents uh, in this sort of middle to top end uh, scoring six or seven. And the, the grade here is zero, no confidence, right the way up to 10, uh, uh, highly confident in the workforce. So uh, on the one hand, that seems to be a, a relatively decent distribution. Uh, most of the respondents are, are, are five and above, but that still leads uh, about 20 something percent uh, who are well below uh, the average. And, and these, I, I think, um, uh, reflecting some of the challenges that people uh, have uh, uh, when they look at their workforce uh, and they think about the question, is this the team that I have in place that's, that's going to help me deliver on the strategy that's my key responsibility? Uh, and finally, then, on, in this first section on uh, building a future-ready workforce, we asked a question about uh, investing. Uh, and you can see here uh, roughly an even split, 48% saying that uh, they feel that they're investing uh, at the right rate, 50% uh, uh, saying uh, too little. And this is something that we can come back to a little bit later on, particularly in the context of uh, a post-COVID environment with all of the challenges and opportunities that that's presented. So that was in, in, in way of sort of setting the scene a little bit, thinking about um, uh, uh, your future ready workforce. And then let's get a, a little bit more detailed and, and dig into issues related to skills and training. Um, so two charts that we have up here. On, on the left-hand side here, you see that uh, pie chart. Uh, so we asked the question, uh, do you have a skills gap uh, in, in your company between uh, the skills and attributes that you need uh, now uh, uh, to be able to deliver on strategy? And uh, a, a strong majority, 85% or so there, saying that, um, uh, yes, there is some kind of skills gap uh, within our organization. Uh, and I don't think this is anything too um, shocking. Uh, we know that there's uh, an, you know, a very tight war for talent uh, in the marketplace. We know that the type of skills uh, that people uh, uh, are, are in high demand uh, are uh, changing quite rapidly as well. So it's, it's natural that there's going to be some kind of gap between the workforce that you have at the moment, unless you're uh, a startup company, uh, and um, uh, what you need to be able to deliver on strategy. And then getting a bit more detail uh, on the right-hand side of the screen here. So how are you primarily uh, addressing these skills gaps? And I think if you look at these columns on, on the left-hand side of that chart here, um, so the first one there is investing in, scale, in, in training to reskill, upskill the, invest, uh, uh, the existing workforce. That seems to be uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the most common response there. Uh, and the second column there, recruiting for new permanent staff 
uh, with the required skills. Uh, so those two, uh, two key areas. If you jump across to the right-hand side of the sc uh, screen there, um, we asked the question, are you using the, the gig economy uh, or um, uh, contractors with specialist skills? And you'll see that big sort of orange component. Uh, that's people saying that this is less important. So uh, that's interesting because we've heard a lot about the sort of gig economy uh, in recent years and how that's building in flexibility. But it still seems that the focus is very much on the workforce that you have at the moment, retaining them and making sure that you're investing uh, in the skills that they need. And then, of course, seeking new talent for the marketplace. Coming on to uh, the next uh, 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 slide, and this gets a little bit more focused on the existing workforce and what efforts are you making there. So uh, it, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen there, uh, increased training and development opportunities, so increased budgets, uh, increased use of um, uh, uh, professional uh, training organizations to come in and help you uh, with all of that, uh, and a much more of a focus on the individual as well, individual development plans. So thinking about the people that you have at the moment, what skills do they need? Where are the gaps that need to be filled for that particular employee and building the training and development program uh, around uh, uh, the person rather than the organization? Um, and then you can see some, some less important responses over here, maybe something of, uh, of concern for the government in Singapore, um, participation in, in, in government schemes, only 13% of uh, respondents across the region uh, said that, maybe it's a little bit higher here, uh, we, we're, we're taught to our guests that are both uh, headquartered here a little bit later on, and maybe that's one issue we can uh, uh, look at there. And then moving on to uh, the next couple of charts, we've got two uh, uh, pie charts here. Um, and, you know, no surprises. We've asked this every year for the past six or seven years, and there are no shortage of surveys out there about um, uh, people skills and digital skills. So we asked these two questions. People skills are increasingly important to the success uh, of my business. And uh, a very large majority uh, um, are saying, uh, yes, uh, of course they are. But interestingly, if you look at the dark blue uh, color there, 81% saying they, they strongly agree with the people skills component. If you jump across to the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see that that number drops down to about 57%. So yes, of course, people skills and digital skills are very important, but it still seems that people skills um, are, are beating out the digital skills at the moment. And again, that's something interesting, something that we can come back to a little bit later on. If you look at the paper, which is available uh, for download uh, from today, uh, part of our analysis there is that um, the technology gets so advanced that it becomes something that we do, that it becomes ubiquitous, that we don't actually uh, interact uh, with it, that it's, it's just there in the same way that uh, infrastructure is. And so therefore, it's less of a need on the people with those really hard digital skills. Of course, we need those in the organization, but most of the people uh, in, in the company uh, are, are going to be uh, um, uh, relying much more on their people skills. And, uh, and again, that's something I think has become more important over the last few months. Moving on to, uh, I think, the final uh, slides in this section around skills and training. Again, uh, two charts, the, uh, the pie chart on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, we're thinking about um, how you go about developing uh, uh, the skills. And uh, what's been very clear, I think, uh, in, in some of the papers that we've done over the past few years, is that we don't do this alone, that we, that we look to build a wider ecosystem or network uh, of partners that can help us uh, develop the skills uh, that we need. And so we asked that type of question. And uh, you'll see there that uh, the vast majority, just uh, about three quarters of respondents saying uh, that they agree with that statement, that they are looking to build uh, a wider ecosystem. Uh, and then getting a little bit more granular on the right hand side of the screen there, you'll see that um, we asked, well, who's in your network? And people could select from a number of responses there. Uh, and uh, technology providers and universities uh, right at the top, uh, which um, uh, we'll come back to universities a little bit later on when we bring in our final speaker. Uh, but technology providers, I think, is also an interesting one uh, as well as many tech uh, uh, providers move away from the hardware to software and then services and cloud. Of course, they want to get involved in that um, uh, in helping their clients uh, to utilize that technology as well and move into uh, areas where perhaps uh, they haven't had so much experience uh, uh, in their traditional business models. Okay, so then finally, uh, uh, moving on to a section which focuses on much more on, on the individual business leader. So we wanted to find out more about um, how you are uh, uh, driving or delegating when it comes to um, uh, leading the transformation. Um, so first question there on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see when it comes to ensuring that the workforce has the necessary skills to allow you to execute on strategy, do you drive or do you delegate? 
uh, and 73% they're saying that they're driving that process. Now, this is interesting. Uh, again, if you go to the paper, uh, you'll see that I reference um, an earlier report that we did in 2015 where we asked pretty much exactly the same question. Uh, and the response that we got there, 55%, uh, I think it was, was saying that they delegated that process and that they were delegating it uh, to uh, HR uh, heads, uh, maybe to the uh, CTO, to CIOs uh, as well. Uh, um, of course, it's not completely like for like. There's a five-year difference in, in, in time in, uh, in, in asking this question. Uh, we'll have different uh, uh, people responding to the question as well. But that does seem to be quite a significant shift from people taking more ownership of this need uh, to get involved uh, in developing a future-ready workforce. Moving across to the right-hand uh, side of the screen, we asked um, some more follow-up questions around this. And so this next one was uh, thinking about your, your senior leadership team. Uh, and again, we had a whole paper uh, on this, I think about uh, three or four years ago to look at this in, uh, in some detail. But uh, we, uh, we posed the question, are you confident that your senior leadership team are transformation champions? Because we know that leading from the front, uh, that supporting everybody from, from bottom up, but from top down as well, uh, is, is very important. And therefore, all of your team needs to be transformation uh, champions. So the vast majority of people there are agreeing that that's the case, but just under 30%, uh, so only 30% uh, uh, percent are strongly agreeing with that statement as well. And, and that's maybe an area that we can look at as well in terms of making sure that everybody's on the same message, that, they, uh, that they're promoting the same vision that you have uh, in terms of building uh, your, your talent. Moving on to uh, the next slide, um, this is an issue that we come uh, across quite often. We've had plenty of meetings where we look at the realities of driving a digital transformation uh, within uh, the organization. And of course, there's always uh, challenges. Uh, there is also uh, resistance uh, to change as well. So we wanted to dig into that a little bit uh, in, in a bit more detail. And we pose these questions. What, what internal challenges are you facing in terms of developing your future ready workforce? And if you go to the, the left hand side of the screen, uh, you'll see this resistance to change mindset. Uh, and, and this is something that comes up time and again. It's not so much the technology. Uh, it's uh, less about getting the buy-in from uh, the board in terms of investment and so on. It's about individuals. And more specifically, it's about the mindset that they have in, uh, as well, which le leads then to a whole sort of set of questions about how do you change that mindset? How do you get people on board? How do you get people pulling uh, uh, together and in the same direction. So mindset being um, uh, the first one. Uh, and, and the second biggest response there, pace of change, too slow. Uh, and again, I think you know, one of the lessons over the last three, uh, four months or so has been uh, uh, that um, uh, COVID has, uh, has uh, led to a, a demand or an imperative for us to accelerate the pace of change as well uh, for reasons around uh, resilience and agility, uh, for example. Um, and then you get into that sort of middle uh, section there about the organizational structure, about uh, a lack of buy-in corporate culture. These seems to be less important. And um, if you go right over to the right-hand side, um, nobody's complaining, or very few people complaining that the pace of change uh, is too fast. Uh, and interestingly there, if you look at the, uh, that, um, uh, uh, that, that chart on the right-hand side, 11.5% of people saying that um, the fear of technology will take jobs uh, is an issue. But so in other words, uh, a vast majority of people saying that that's not an issue. So all of those debates that we had about AI taking jobs, uh, that doesn't seem to be coming through as a challenge in driving transformation at the moment. Uh, and I think um, uh, one or two more charts to, uh, to wrap this up. Um, okay, so you've identified some of the challenges that you're facing, uh, a, mind, a resistance to change mindset being uh, the top one there. Uh, so what are you doing about that? How are you overcoming these challenges? Uh, and interestingly, here the biggest response there, just over three quarters of people saying uh, constant communication. Uh, and, and, and I know that this is uh, one of the things that we can discuss uh, in a moment with, uh, with our speakers. Um, and then uh, moving on down, having a dedicated team to focus on uh, transformation initiatives, sharing success success stories. So all of this really coming back to uh, communication. It's less about the technology itself. It's about getting people on board, uh, showing them how this is going to transform uh, uh, the business, where it's taking them, uh, and why you're doing this. OK, so um, let me just uh, um, uh, take a pause there uh, as we um, then move into our uh, panel discussion. So what I've done is uh, just given you a little bit of background about the paper that we're releasing today. Uh, and just to recap, we wanted to look at um, where we are with that 
sort of future ready workforce, uh, what types of uh, skills and training we need in, in order to, uh, uh, to realize that vision. Uh, and finally, what's the role of the business leader uh, in, in leading that? Uh, are, are, are they in fact leading that or, or delegating? So uh, with, with that in hand, um, I'm now going to uh, turn to uh, my guests uh, here with me in Singapore. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. It's a terrible day. It's raining heavily outside, so uh, we're not getting that lovely view of the Singapore uh, skyline. Um, but thank you very much for joining us. And let me just um, uh, introduce my guest. So immediately left to me, uh, uh, we have Mahesh uh, Ayer, who is the CEO uh, of Growth Markets for um, uh, Signify. Um, uh, we, that you might know um, previously as, as Philip's Lighting. Okay. Uh, and when we say growth markets, I was looking at um, uh, Mahesh's details uh, uh, just yesterday. That's a huge territory you have. Japan, Korea, ASEAN, Pacific, India, Middle East, Turkey, Pakistan, and, and Africa. So, uh, Mahesh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and we're also joined by Uma Thana Balasingham, uh, who is the Vice President, Channel Chief for Asia Pacific and Japan at VMware. Uh, and also, I should note, and maybe we'll come back to this a little bit later on, uh, one of the founders of Lean In uh, Singapore as well. Yeah. So, thank you very much both uh, for joining us. Sure. Um, Ma Mahesh, maybe if I could come to you first. So I've just been running through the findings uh, of this paper. Um, I know that you've been to many of the meetings that we have here in Singapore, looking at digital transformation, uh, looking at talent as well. Yep. Maybe if I could just get your um, uh, 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 initial thoughts on what we've been sharing, and then we can get into a, a bit of a conversation about um, how you've been involved uh, in talent development, what you've been uh, seeing, over, particularly over the last few months um, uh, as a, re a result of the COVID uh, crisis. But perhaps before we get there, but if you could get us a, a little bit more sense of, uh, of who you are and, and what you do. Sure, absolutely. So I, I head up growth markets for Signify, as you rightly said. It's basically Asia Pacific except China plus Middle East and Africa, so it's a large beat. But I think for me, uh, the entire piece on transformation and tech is very, very key. Now, I work in lighting, and you can consider that lighting is a very, very boring world. You had a bulb and you changed it. And that was our business model for many years, right? But then we had three major transformations the last two decades. The first one, of course, from moving from conventional light sources towards much more energy efficient or LED, right? So that saved your energy, very good for the planet. But if you didn't play it carefully, you could kill your own future revenue because in the old days of the bulbs, you sold one, next year it failed, you sold another, and it was all about distribution or replacement. But with LEDs, they now last eight years, 10 years. So basically you could kill your own future revenue stream. Mm -hmm. right? So that's one piece of that, how can we utilize LEDs to actually drive our own business? So that's one of the transformations we had to go through, that one. Second was moving towards much more connected systems. Obviously the fact that there is far more uh, interconnected systems, IoT, how can we have lighting play a part? So that's the part we are at the moment undergoing. And the third one, as we are starting to work much more, is how do we take lighting beyond illumination? So here we are talking about things like, hey, can I have Wi-Fi, which will have light can carry data, and also therefore help offices, cities manage their entire systems. So for us, it was a huge transformation, and obviously it's not been easy, and uh, that's something that we've been working on. And if I had to take a couple of pieces, in the end for us, it was indeed about building skills because people do in our company have extensive knowledge about customers, applications, that's key. But we had to inculcate software. We are classically a traditional hardware company, right? And the last five to seven years, we had to change. And some part of it was build, some part of it was buy, some part was borrow. Go to partners, get some more talent, buy talent in some cases, because now we had to switch from selling a product to selling solutions and services something we're completely not familiar with. And that's what we've been going, going about doing. Uh, I would say we are probably about 70% on our journey. Fascinating journey, still some way to go. But as we go along, we start to realize that, hey, with the LED technology, the fact that it can be easily controlled, it can actually play with terms of light, and more importantly, work with the overall other systems, be it city management or building management systems, it starts to lend us to be much more amenable to our customers because this is exactly what they see. So you don't sell light bulbs anymore, don't lighting anymore. You're now selling lighting for 10 years. Hey, I can give you a safe city for seven years. City council, listen to me. So I think that's been a fascinating journey of how we have transformed and how tech in that sense has been a very, very key part. Could you give us a little bit more background about, uh, about VMware, about your role in that? Sure. So we're close to 22 years old. We're a US-based company. And we see our role as really that you know, they could this digital foundation that we give to customers. 
bringing together the world of operations and developers in a consistent environment that's going to allow them to accelerate innovation. And the way that we do that is to bring the ability for any customer to run any application on any cloud, on any device, securely and through uh, networking. And we see our jobs at here as helping customers to be on the right side of technology. And we talk about the four superpowers of technology. And Mike can kind of talk about some of them. So the first one is around artificial intelligence and machine learning, which you captured in your study. And that's an overnight 30 year success, I would say, but simply because the technology has matured and we have enough data to glean insights and intelligence from it. And then cloud, you know, unimaginable scale. You and I could go build a supercomputer this weekend on a Visa or MasterCard, and if we bought a Michael Dell's Amex card, we could probably build the world's biggest of the computer with this weekend, right? Um, and then IoT and Edge, right? The ability to bring your physical and digital worlds together. Um, and mobile, with over 60% of the world now that has a consistent mobile connection, just giving you different access to customers today. Um, and so our role is to really harness the power of software in order to do that and be on the right side of technology so that customers can really lift and accelerate their business. Now my role here in Asia Pacific and Japan and for us that covers 48 markets um, is with our partner ecosystem. Uh, so we work with about 8,000 partners here in Asia Pacific and Japan and we've really built our install base exclusively with them. So our dependency on working with partners across Asia is massive. Um, and you talk a little bit about that in your paper as well, and the, that dependency, I think, has increased uh, with the current normal that we're working on. So, so that I mean, we, we captured in there the, the increasing need to, to, to build the ecosystem, to work with partners and so on. Interestingly, um, part of that was in terms of bringing in the skills and experience that you need as well. So it's not only helping your clients with utilizing technology, do you get involved with um, helping that organization as well um, uh, in terms of the, the, the talent that they have within the organization to, to access this technology? Is that a part of, of how you see your role as, as a partner? Yeah, absolutely. So we have very uh, different sets of partners. Um, and, you know, there used to be a very traditional way of describing partners in the tech world before. You know, you might have been a value-added reseller or a systems integrator or a distributor, etc. Now, those lines are very much familiar today. And, you know, our partners are also our customers today in terms of taking our technology and bringing that as a service to their set of customers. So we do work with them in many different types of routes to market. And, you know, a great example in terms of how we're driving innovation with partners in emerging markets, for example, in Thailand, where we have a customer called Nimbus, which is a startup that's providing uh, inventory management as a service, uh, really looking at, you know, with Thailand 4.0, actually over 20,000 of retail wholesalers are still, you know, working on pen and paper as they take orders, and probably the owners are the only ones who know the 3,000 uh, prices on the shelf in their shops and in their retail branches. And with working with one of our cloud partners in Thailand, they were able to bring digital transformation at a very affordable price, so 33 baht per day, so that's US $1 per day, to these wholesalers so that they can do inventory management, change pricing, you know, manage their retail branches on the cloud, and doing it affordably, right? reducing the cost of doing business by 40%, but also helping to future-proof these wholesalers in Thailand. Mm, yeah. Let's bring the focus on uh, internally, on the organization itself, because we, we're asking a lot about the type of skills that, that, that people need. And your company, tech company, so you're going to have a lot of people with, with those skills. What, what's that sort of journey like? If we were to be asking you the question about how future ready is your own workforce, where, where are you on that journey? What efforts are you taking? I wonder if you could give us a, a, a bit of an insight into a tech company and, and, and yeah. how that resonates there. Yeah. So we have a leadership code um, in VMware, and it really divides into what our values are, what's our mindset, and what are the skills. And actually, one of the most recent changes we made in our mindset was changing the word resilience to grit. And in that, we are saying that you need to bring passion, 
along with perseverance and having a very clear point of view in terms of where you want to go and having that consistency, endurance, and tenacity together. Um, and I would say, you know, we pivoted very quickly. Back in March, we were supposed to bring our entire sales organization here in Singapore for a virtual kickoff, and we pivoted that very quickly to an online environment of close to 2,000 people. Um, we um, also are getting our executives. Uh, so Pat Gelsinger is our CEO, and last year was voted uh, by Glassdoor as the best CEO in the world. Now Pat and the executive team are doing much more in that communication piece in your survey, in reaching out to our team. So a lot more town halls and uh, what Pat calls Zoom bombing, where you know as soon as he's finishing with the media in Australia, he's you know Zoom bombing a Brazilian meeting and saying hi. Now that would have been impossible for him to do before, and so we're doing a lot more executive engagements as part of that, and he's actually pivoting. You know, this week I'm going to work in the European time zone and the next week I'm going to work in the Asia time zone to support our partners and customers. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, we're also seeing it in terms of our talent. And one very interesting thing that we saw last week in Japan uh, is because as we think about innovation, diversity is going to be important. And part of that diversity focus in VMware is bringing in new talent. And we bring in new college graduates from universities and Usually we see um, last year about 71 females show up at the first interview, but this round we saw 205. Wow. And actually we've increased our intake of female new college graduates in Japan now from 21% to 52%. And we're actually digging deeper into that. Now outside of the fact that they didn't have to show up to an interview physically and everything was done virtually, including the application, we're trying to see what lessons we can learn from that. Very interesting. Um, about five years ago, we had a meeting in, in Japan looking at diversity uh, in Japan, looking at technology and looking at, uh, at women as well. And um, we had a speaker in from, from Dell who were basically saying, you know, we do work from home. This is one of, one of the things that we try, do try to help our clients with. And we do that internally. And the vast majority of their new intake were women who needed more flexibility in, in working arrangements because travel, childcare, elder care, these type of areas. So that's very interesting sort of uh, topic. Um, I should just uh, remind everybody that we do have the uh, the Slido uh, poll, and we'll be coming to those uh, uh, results uh, in, in, in a few moments. Um, but I want to continue um, on, on on this vein of you know what's been changing uh, over the last uh, three three months. And uh, Mahesh, we, we talked earlier a little bit. Um, uh, on the issue of, of training, uh, for example. You were talking, in the survey, we talked about rejuvenating the existing yeah. workforce and, uh, and so on. There seems to be more of a focus on or investing in, in training, development, individual uh, plans and so on. Um, but in this particular context of the last three months or so, you heard about the pivot there. Um, what's been happening uh, with Signify? Yeah, I think with uh, the COVID syndrome, the positive thing about it, it has forced us to accelerate our entire digital transformation. So if I talk specifically on learning, um, and I'll take the most difficult people, which is the sales guys, right? These are the guys who bring the business, but they also sometimes are the most ones who are most happy with their customer relationship, the fact that there always has to be a one-on-one, -on -one and so on. And it does work. I'm not saying it doesn't. It, it works very well. But with COVID, they couldn't do those calls anymore, right? So we had to equip them to say, OK, now how do you make a virtual call? Second one, how do you do webinars rather than a face-to-face -face presentation? Now, these are skills we had to build overnight, and which we did. And I mean, I'm glad that we did something called, we have something called learning at Signify, which is like a digital university. So you, it's personalized courses. So you can choose the course you want, because what we've realized is if you put many people into a classroom, some are interested, some are not, and there are different topics, right? Mm -hmm. So, But if you make a personalized training, you can choose the topic you want training on. It happens to be online that's uh, useful. With COVID, we are very, very glad we had done it because I think we would have struggled quite a bit if we hadn't. Uh, so sales guys suddenly start to learn about how to make a virtual call because we would still help them and said, you know what? Customer contact is important. Mm -hmm. You still need to make your three to four calls a day. Now you make them virtually. Helped because the customers felt engaged too because they have the same problem. They're also isolated, right? So they want to know what's more happening in terms of information. They were very happy to get the calls. Second aspect, how do you use suddenly your call register more? So salesforce.com, how do you register your projects? Far more use in terms of uh, interaction and software skills. And there we had to 
it's, it's worked very well that they had to really start upscaling themselves from their traditional selling style to far more way of digital working. And I see that as beneficial because even when we move out of COVID and physical contact is managed anymore, I can still see that these some of these calls are useful because A, they can increase the efficiency in terms of selling. Second is get an audience, especially for webinars. We've got audiences who are really only interested in topics. So we've got 300, 400 people on a webinar, whereas if we went to a seminar, yeah, you could get 100 odd people, half of them thinking coffee and half of them thinking lunch. But this one, one hour, very, very focused, people really interested in the topic. So uh, for us, reskilling in terms of Salesforce on how do you manage a situation like this has been beneficial. And I, I see that those benefits going across. Yeah. Ditto with R&D, I think R&D had to pick up software skills, which they have. And uh, I mean, the fact that many of the meetings are digital, the work from anywhere has become a very, very useful concept. I think for me, that basically means that, especially on an ecosystem, you could go to any partner anywhere. You don't have to worry about saying, this person is going to be in Singapore. It can be anywhere. So you can bring in some of those skills as well. So, so in many ways, COVID has been a challenge to business, but in other ways, has fast forwarded us on the digital transformation because suddenly we know how to use tools. We are forced to use tools and we're finding actually it works. So uh, and, 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 and if I could stay on that same area uh, of you know what's what, what's changed and, and maybe if you had some comment on, on the sort of training aspect of that as well, because it has been, um, uh, you know, it's been a crisis, but it's, it's forced people to accelerate and think again, to look differently it had a delivering training, how they're interacting with, uh, with with clients and so on. What's been the experience at, at, at VMware? Yeah. So at the kickoff, one of the trainings that we provided, and there's many modules that come beneath it, is about effectively working in a virtual environment. And actually, what we do there is really focusing on this concept that right now you can't be dependent on the hierarchical structure that to wait for the instructions to come from the top to you, but have the skill and ability to manage up, down, and across, and work with multiple stakeholders in a company the size of ours, and be able to connect the dots and deliver the outcome. And you know, part of that is also, as we look at talent, you know, we no longer have those metrics, but it, it is about looking at candidates that are um, leading edge versatile, for example. And so what I just talked about is really putting someone in the box of versatile. Um, because as we look at talent going forward, um, it may not necessarily be just about hiring somebody in the country where the role exists today. Um, so back to what Mahesh is saying, we do say that everyone in VMware as a salesperson now becomes an inside sales rep. Um, and so the way that we communicate with customers also needs to be more deliberate because you've got a certain amount of time. You need to get your point across with clarity and get to the outcomes because previously you might have a physical meeting and allow that dialogue to flow. That's no longer the luxury because there is a Zoom fatigue. You know, we use Zoom as a platform. And so the way you organize and manage those meetings has also changed. Um, so those are some of the things that we look at. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm just going to remind everybody of the, of the Slido um, uh, poll that we have. And, uh, and also that's an opportunity for people to be sending in uh, some questions as well. Um, uh, hopefully we've got the technology sorted out and um, uh, on the screen you, you'll be able to see the responses uh, that we've had so far. Uh, and let's just uh, have a look at these. So um, uh, uh, all of these questions, we really wanted to sort of update on, on, on where we are as a, res uh, uh, as a result of COVID. So the first one there, as a result of the uh, pandemic, do you plan to accelerate efforts to develop a future ready workforce? And 56% uh, there saying that they do. Um, uh, strongly agree, uh, another 37% uh, saying that they somewhat agree. So certainly some, as we've heard from, from both yeah. of you, but also from, uh, from this quick poll here, uh, that things are, are going to be uh, accelerated. Um, the next question uh, that we had up there was, um, uh, in light of the pandemic, uh, do you think that your uh, investment in developing a future-ready workforce is about right uh, or too little? And uh, an interesting, just under 6% saying uh, not enough. Um, so that, that suggests, go back to that poll that we had in, yep. in the paper as well, it was a sort of roughly 
I think 48, 50 uh, percent um, uh, we're investing at the right pace or, or, or not enough. It seems that there might be some more uh, investment coming down uh, the pipe uh, in recognition of a need to accelerate things. How, how does that bring with you? Do, do you see within the organization that you're going to be putting a bit more money uh, into um, uh, accelerating uh, the development of your future ready workforce or I guess in, in terms of uh, talent in general? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we're looking at many different ways to drive diversity. So for example, we did recently introduce that in our pipeline of candidates, uh, not only do you have to have a gender uh, diversity, but also race. Um, and so that's a change that we made recently. And one of the examples that we have here in Asia Pacific is in India where um, just before last year, we launched Project Tara, and Tara means star um, in uh, Hindi, uh, where we know that over 50% of uh, females who graduate in technology actually drop out of the workforce because they have, um, you know, home commitments, etc. And so we launched Project Tara, where we aim to bring up to 15,000 women in India back to work and what we're putting them through is free VMware digital transformation certifications so that they have the confidence, their skills are relevant. Um, and we work with partners like NTT, who asked we to announce uh, their commitment to partner with VMware in order to hire this woman once they're back. And I think these are some of the things that we're doing in terms of ensuring that our workforce is future ready because the diversity is going to be a big part of that, that diversity of thought as we continue to innovate ourselves, but also bring innovation to customers, that's going to be key. Yeah, uh, same, same question on that sort of pace of investment. Absolutely, I think it'll increase because I think the advantage with the, the fact that the last three months have proven that you can actually do that at with speed. Earlier, I think most of the uh, investments made in people or future ready workforce was, are we ready for it? Is it really worth it? But this has now shown that it is worth it because it has happened. So for, for uh, Signify as different from VMware, it will be much more about rescaling. So, uh, so that's the part we will work on much more because what we've, again, come back to realize is virtual ways of selling beat inside sales. That's a critical part. How are you able to deliver and demonstrate projects which are working, again, with customers who are far away? So, so I think that it's going to be an entire area of rescaling, especially on the aspect of uh, selling, also in terms of R&D and software. Mm -hmm. So how can we continuously strengthen our entire portfolio? I think on the hiring piece, uh, for us as a company, since we are many, we are almost 125 years old, order, is a lot of it is going to come from new people. So we, I'm, I'm with Uma saying we need to hire more, but these are going to be young graduates who are familiar with digital. It comes ingrained with that. They can be the change agents. It's much easier to get them in rather than uh, trying to reskill everyone. So I think it will be a combination of both. Mm. And uh, given the fact where we are and business is still what it is, I would say a lot more effort on uh, digital transformation, especially in case study. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, let's move on. Uh, we'll go back to the, uh, the Slido poll. We've got two uh, further questions there. Um, and uh, this next one here, following the experience of working during the pandemic, do you think that you'll be spending more time on skills related issues than previously. So that's, that's you individually rather than uh, the organization itself. And 47% uh, um, strong, uh, somewhat agree, another 27% uh, somewhat uh, agree. So uh, just under 70% or so, uh, think just around 70% um, uh, agreeing with that. Does that resonate with you as well? Just, just to rephrase that, because of the, uh, uh, the crisis that we've had, um, uh, and the need to sort of focus more on people and, and so on. Do you think that you'll be spending more time with your team and, 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 and on these type of issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, as a leader, I think it's important to think about whether your teams are participating versus engaging. Mm -hmm. um, because in a virtual environment, I think, you can end up with a lot of people that are participating. And to Mahesh's point, as we bring in, you call it the digital natives, the younger generation, the way that we need to engage them is actually very different. So we do spend more time now thinking about this because I think a lot of corporations will agree that they pivoted very quickly and did it very well in terms of work from home and it works, etc. 
and we're learning some new things. But that was disaster recovery mode. Mm -hmm. Now, exactly. what is it going to look like in an ongoing mode? Because I read, I think, in the Fortune 500 CEO survey that they are saying they expect this to go on for another year. So I think we really need to be thinking about that engagement piece versus the participation yeah. piece. That's a, that's a really important point, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. On, on that issue. Well, I think on the engagement piece, I agree with Uma. I think what's happened again in the last three months is the fact that a lot of us were at home. It actually enabled me to engage much more with employees than I have. Earlier, you would be traveling, you were stuck with customer meetings, but now we have much more time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also come back from a lot of employees that suddenly the senior management is much more accessible, far more available to them. Mm -hmm. And again, coming back on communication and like transformation requires communication. This was also a shock for many people, right? It's, it's not an easy one. People are wondering, hey, what is the business that I'm going to come back? What happens to me? What happens to my job? So reassuring them, telling them, hey, things are not uh, all bad. We, can, we will recover from this. Communication becomes a very, very critical piece. So in that sense, I think the technology has worked. And, uh, and indeed, whether it's working from home, whether it's Zoom, whether it's Teams, whatever be it, Communication still remain very, very key. And that's what we did. And I think the other piece which we realized, not just beyond employees, is also at customers. Sometimes we tend to forget that our customers are probably even less lengthier because in the end, we are still multinationals. We have linked to technology. Some of them just have a computer, nothing else. Engaging them was also very, very key. And I think in that sense, we've probably strengthened the loyalty and uh, of the customers because they had information, much more information about COVID and how to deal with it than they had in the past. Yeah. So that's helped. And of course, things like webinars make a big difference. Some of are still, from a knowledge standpoint, continuing to upgrade the knowledge rather than having lost it. You mentioned remote working now. Both yeah. of you uh, mentioned this. And there's a few questions sort of coming in about uh, that, that as well. Um, uh, how has your experience of, of that been? Has it fundamentally changed the way that you view the workplace. We're here in the central business district of <laughs> Singapore. And a lot of people are talking about what's the future of this when we've realized that actually a lot of people can work at home and get a better life, a work life balance and, uh, and so on. But, but what's your experience have been of the, in terms of the organization? And you were talking there about moving from sort of um, crisis mode to you know, how is this going to really shape us going forward? On that particular issue of you know, remote working, virtual working, What's changed within VMware, if at all? And, and how do you see that um, um, developing over the next few months? Years? Yeah. Um, I think we are learning a few things. I mean, one is around, despite us pivoting very quickly, in fact, in April, we had the largest software shipment ever. And so, you know, everyone was productive. But as you know, in Asia, for some companies, or most companies, the way we measure productivity would have been how much time are you spending at your desk and who was sending the email at 10 p.m. or closing the lights in the office. Um, and now the way that we need to measure is around the outcomes. And so that's one piece. Um, mental health is the other piece that has come up in VMware, which we're paying attention to. And actually in our leadership forum, which we do on a monthly basis for direct level and above in Asia, we had one of our employees um, in Australia talk openly about how he was going through this and was in denial, etc., and how he decided to just talk about it and ask for help. And actually, in Asia, despite having employee assistant programs, it's not very well utilized. And so we're making an effort to just, you know, it's okay to actually get help and talk about it and ask for help, which um, in Asian cultures may be not very well received uh, before and actually mental health isn't mental illness you know that delineation is, is important um, and then you know thinking about our different work environments for everyone you know whether it's working moms um, here in Singapore when home-based learning started I think quite a few of them struggled in my team yeah. um, and everyone was waiting for the schools to open again um, and um, our inside sales teams, you know, a lot of them are very young. They're either living with their families or they're sharing apartments and they all they only have a room. And that's their work environment for an entire day, not this. Yes. Um, and so they struggle with that as well. Um, and so that separation, you know, with the environment you can work in, for me personally, 
you know, leaving the bedroom in the morning and walking to the dining table is me going to the office mm. and then shutting down at the dining table and going to the living room is leaving the office. Um, you know, that, that form of separation, I've started meditating twice a day for my own mental health. You know, as leaders, I think we have to fill our cup and care for ourselves um, so that we can care for others. Um, so those are some of the things. That's very important point. The same issue of that sort of, is, is this, has the experience of the pandemic, is that going to force a sort of a, a clear change in, in how people work at Sydney? I think so. So I think for myself, if I had to say, first of all, travel was probably exaggerated. So I will not probably travel as much as uh, earlier because you start to realize you can get a lot of work done by not even by not traveling. So I think that's, that's a critical one. I think uh, from an office space time point of view, we, we do realize that certain jobs can still be probably done from home. Or for me, it's work from anywhere. Right, sales guys, you have a laptop. You work work from the from the place where you are. But I still believe that the office atmosphere is not completely gone away. I think there is still a lot of strength in engaging with people, uh, free flow of ideas. That's very difficult to do on a uh, call. Right, uh, it's just the simple social interactions, which are still very very key. And again, if I go back to interactions with customers or for stakeholders, there is that personal chemistry that is important in a face to face or a physical meeting. I think that's also valid for the office. So my opinion, I think we will strike a balance where there will be probably a few more people working from home or working from anywhere from a signified context. I can think that real estate may be optimized, but I still do believe that the working from office still remains because some of this last three months have still proven that going to work, like Uma said, it's not just moving from time to you've gone to a different place of work. Your frame of reference is different. Your mental equipment is different. So you start to think very differently. So I would still say office going is going to be key yeah. uh, in the future. Yeah. But definitely we are finding far more efficient ways of working. Yeah, it's going to be it's a whole sort of range of issues that I'm sure will be coming back to over, over the weeks and months and years yeah. around work, around the, the work environment, how we work, what we do and, and so on. Um, I'll just take us back to the final part of the, uh, of the Slido uh, poll there. Uh, and uh, we asked people to to enter in uh, a word. So thinking about talent, tech, and transformation, what well, one thing will be uh, you be focusing on more as a result of the pandemic? And uh, just to, to, to read out some of the uh, responses here, uh, agility, soft skills, empowerment, um, digitization, uh, transformation, um, resilience, so osmosis one in there as well, which is an interesting <laughs> one, but um, uh, uh, things like agility and, uh, and people coming out a, a, a lot more. So it, it, it seems that, um, you know, this this is a message that's coming out quite loud and clear, uh, that the um, uh, that the crisis has forced us to reevaluate ways in which we work, ways in which we engage with our, our, our workforce, with our, our clients as well, how we use technology, and we'll be looking to accelerate uh, some of those areas. Um, I've got uh, one, one more, um, uh, one or two more questions that I'd like to pose to both of you before I move to our, our, our guest, uh, Charles Fine, who's going to be dialing in from uh, Kuala Lumpur just in a couple of minutes. Um, but one of them is, we talk about all the great things that have been happening, about the, the sort of positives uh, of this and how you've been uh, what, what hasn't worked so well, uh, particularly when it comes to sort of uh, people uh, and uh, and the um, uh, pandemic, uh, and, and secondly, I guess we touched on it a little bit earlier on, but the the challenges that you faced in terms of building that future ready workforce in the survey is around mindset and uh, and, and so on. Um, so so those two uh, key areas. One, you know, what what did you find that that didn't stand up so well uh, during the pandemic, uh, and, and secondly, leaving that aside. Um, uh, you know, overcoming that sort of re resistance to change. What will you be focusing on uh, going forward? Maybe um, I'm a like to sure. you for So I think uh, some of the first question of what's been challenging during the pandemic, I think the human touch, right? That's been very, very key. That's the, that's a piece I've missed quite a bit. I mean, again, it's nice to speak to people over, over the calls and keep your video on. But you still you, you still miss that part. Uh, I think for me also the the fact that in the pandemic we have been very very uh, focused on operational. I mean it, it's more tactical. How do I survive this crisis? Like Umar said, this is survival mode. So survive the crisis. In that sense, we have probably not spent as much time on strategic issues or how do you chart out the future, mm. which we would normally do probably in a work from uh, office situation, right? 
So I think that's something we need to quickly come back on because Uma is right. I mean, it's, it's not going to be just three months. Maybe it's one year, two years. Yeah. We still need to keep our long-term ambition still going forward. So I said these two aspects, the fact that when you're at home, you're really focusing on operational issues, that tends to happen. How do you get it back to strategic and indeed coming back to the human touch? Yeah. Um, on, your, on your second question in terms of uh, skilling, uh, I think I would uh, put it in two parts. First is uh, when we get back to work, right? So key pieces I would still give into perspective, how do you still bring back uh, engagement? I think because one of the key concerns for most employees coming back is, do I have a safe environment, mm -hmm. right? I think that's what the end. Can I travel safely to work? And uh, that's something we have to think about. And we are. So I think the fact that everybody, probably most companies, have a standard protocol of how safe, safe an office is, we are working on that too. We have one. So if you want to open an office, this is the protocol you follow. And you can do very, very simple things like it's not just uh, sanitize and so on, but giving the fact that only the people who need to come to work are the critical jobs. So we do that. And I think it's also about engaging in terms of leadership, right? So for example, when our office opened a couple of weeks back, I had to be the first one to get into work. Important to show the way that this can work. And I think that getting people back to the norm of the crisis is on, but it's starting to get over. You have to get them past. Yeah. Because if you still let them be in the situation where the pandemic is still on, people don't move. So we are in that position where we're saying, okay, now start getting ready for the future, start coming back to work, start to get a slightly different life from what you had before. Yep. 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 Okay, thank you. And Pluma, same, same thing yeah. over here. So I spoke about one of the challenges in terms of how do we really ascertain if employees are engaged uh, versus participating. Um, that was certainly something we picked up. And mental health, I mean, I had three on my leadership team that I needed to get across as well. And, you know, just um, navigating that and making sure we're bringing in the right resources, etc. cetera. Um, and also I think there was a sense when we all pivoted to work from home that there was this sense about needing um, at the ground level to send emails, to show up, because you can't physically be seen to be doing the work. And, you know, one of the things that we had to do at VMware as part of our learning was make sure that as leaders, we're really focusing on the big box and what outcomes we want to achieve um, versus, you know, just measuring productivity of our time spent. Um, and as we think about the future, we are looking at work 2.0 differently. And it's in three areas. So firstly, around the workforce itself, and that's all about driving engagement. Um, you know, so how do we think about learning and development differently, etc. Uh, the second piece is around the workplace. Um, you know, what would our future offices look like? Uh, will there be as many offices? Uh, what would collaboration spaces look like, etc.? Uh, and then lastly, it's the work itself and productivity. And this is where we're thinking more about the systems and technologies that can help support our employees. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think a clear, clear message there, I think, about um, we need to move beyond the sort of crisis mode, dealing with everything to, to, to adjusting to a new reality and making sure that we don't lose sight of the strategic imperatives of the business, the vision of the business and, and leading that from the front. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Mahash, Uma, for, for, for being here and, and sharing some thoughts and, uh, and helping us to digest some of the, uh, the learnings from, um, the, from the paper as well. Um, I'm going to uh, invite um, um, our, our next speaker um, to join us now. Um, Charles Fine uh, is the CEO a professor and Dean of the Asia School of um, uh, Business that's based in Kuala Lumpur and also the sponsor of this research uh, this year. So thank you very much indeed uh, for the support of the research. Um, Charles, hopefully you've been able to um, uh, listen in to uh, uh, the discussions that we've had here, very wide ranging um, from tech, talent to COVID and, and responses to all of that. Uh, I wonder if I could come to you um, and first of all, get your your uh, your thoughts and comments on that. And then secondly, um, given your role uh, at business school here uh, in, in Asia and of course, engaging with executives and helping them as they uh, reimagine their workforce as well, focus a little bit more on the sort of skills training uh, uh, aspects of some of the discussions that we've had this morning. Um, so Charles, hopefully you're there. Yes, good morning. Thank you. It's a pleasure to join you and a uh, great discussion. And thank you to Mahesh and Uman for, for, the, for the insights. Uh, I guess one comment I would have is that I think from both of the, the speakers, we heard 
that there's a need for both what we might call uh, smart skills, that is skills related to uh, organization, team, uh, critical thinking, etc., as well as what we call sharp skills or uh, understanding digital technologies, understanding how to use uh, 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 statistics and analytics uh, and uh, make best use of the technology. So, so there's this seems to be this need for a balance between uh, and a combination of the of the people skills, if you will, and the technology skills, and, and uh, that that seems to be a common theme, and it's a common theme in what we see in our own uh, educational processes that uh, we can't expect to just teach the political tools, the sharp skills, uh, or the uh, people skills, the smart skills. We really have to do both, and, and it's the balance that uh, that people have to be open to learning and working together. Uh, and also be able to use the the modern tools if you will, of uh, of analytics. So, so that seemed to be one uh, common theme uh, that we heard. Uh, and it reminds me, uh, about nine years ago, there was a book written uh, called "The Battle Hymn of the of the Tiger Mom." Many of you may remember the the Tiger Mom book. And uh, in that book, uh, the author, who was a Yale professor, uh, boasted about how uh, she trained her children, in, uh, in some sense, in, in the sharp skills. Uh, she had them focus on mathematics and uh, and uh, history and, and and studies, but she didn't allow them to go out in social events or, or go to parties because she thought that was a waste of time. And uh, there was a lot of criticism of that book in saying, well, you're too one-sided, that, uh, that it's much harder for someone to master the dynamics of going to a, a sl overnight slumber party than it is to master mathematics. And, and people need to learn how to interact with others and how to work together in teams. And I think actually that's one thing that maybe wasn't talked about so much this morning is how much work needs to be done in teams versus how much work gets done by individuals. And I think we find uh, in the work that we do with many companies, teams are, and learning to work in teams and, and coping now with digital teams is, uh, is a critical skill. So, so, so uh, could, 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 can I sort of jump in on that a little bit more? Because um, the importance of um, soft skills and people skills of interaction and so on, team building, it clearly comes through in this report and others that we've done as well, as you were just highlighting. So how do we go about doing that in this new environment where maybe people aren't in the office so much and, and uh, maybe also thinking about yourselves as a business school? Because part of the attraction is that you bring people together, you create networks, uh, 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 in, in person as well. Um, so, so two questions there. Uh, one, I, th I guess, more general about how companies could go about um, uh, helping to develop those, those people skills in this type of environment. And then secondly, what's your experience been uh, of that at uh, Asia School of Business? Yeah, so I'm going to answer those in reverse order uh, because uh, what we find is, so our curriculum is uh, uh, one third of the time the students spend in what we call action learning projects. That is projects working with companies in teams uh, where, they, where they live on site uh, with the companies using the tools that they learn uh, in the classroom. And so, so, so we emphasize those skills quite a bit in terms of, of teamwork and what we call the smart skills. Uh, what we found when COVID struck is that we had to move those projects to digital mode. That is, we had uh, a bunch of student teams working on projects with companies and all of a sudden everybody had to go home and, and work from there. And what we found is that uh, that the students having in some sense mastered the ability to work in teams were able to maintain that capability even when they went to digital and engage uh, the corporate uh, partners. That in fact, uh, even though people were at home, there, there was still uh, a thirst for collaboration, a thirst for working together thirst for exchange of ideas, and that once you had established a relationship uh, with the people on, in the group, it wasn't that hard in some sense to continue those conversations, continue the brainstorming, continue to work together. So, so what we found is that uh, our students with that capability can help catalyze that in organizations as well, that they see how our students have learned to work with, in teams, and when they're engaged in a team with those people who have that predilection, and our students tend to be young and, and more the digital natives types, 
it helps draw in uh, the people in the in the, in our corporate uh, partners uh, to, in some sense, learn and grow together uh, with the students. So, so we see that there's a synergy there, uh, and uh, I think organizations need to cultivate that. They need to cultivate the habits of working together, working in teams, uh, collaboration, uh, so that when the pandemic strikes, if you will, there's, uh, there's already a pattern and a habit of working together and, and it makes it easier to move to the digital platforms. Thank you. And, and, and the, the first, second part of the question was, was around ASB itself and, uh, and, and how you've um, adjusted to that. Yeah, so, so as, as mentioned, so, so we moved our, our projects to digital. So our students continue their projects, but on digital. In terms of our own organization, uh, we, uh, we, we're, we're, we're uh, at the limit of Zoom fatigue, perhaps. That is, uh, we have a lot of different teams working on a lot of different aspects of our program, and we've moved them all to, uh, to uh, Zoom meetings. And uh, I think that's gone reasonably well. Uh, there is a challenge to make sure that everybody's engaged, uh, as uh, Uman mentioned, uh, make sure everybody stays connected, uh, dealing with uh, the stresses and the mental health, uh, the work from home challenges. For some people, we find the introverts uh, maybe love working from home and the extroverts miss the human contact and we have to try to help everybody along uh, to, to keep them uh, connected. I'd also mention another point that Uman made, which relates to diversity, that, uh, that we find our, our students come from over 30 different countries, our faculty come from over 15 different countries. Uh, uh, we have a roughly 60-40 gender balance, so not quite 50-50, but we're close in terms of students as well as, uh, actually our, our staff is 60-40 women to men, our students are 60-40 men to women. Uh, but. Uh, but the diversity in terms of ethnicity, in terms of race, in terms of nationality, in terms of gender, really helps the, uh, the, the stimulation of, of ideas and the catalyzation of uh, how do we think about adjusting? How do we work differently? How do we work better? You get a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different ideas, and, and, and we find that's been quite helpful in, uh, in making this transition. Um, if I could take you back to a couple of points that were raised in, in the paper around um, driving the transformation resistance that people find and, and ways in which they can overcome those, uh, those challenges as well. Now, at Asia School of Business, you, you do work with the, the C-suite, you do work with the, uh, with the organizations as well, but I, I wonder if you could give us a sense of how you help uh, business leaders to overcome those challenges um, or those resistance, that resistance to change that they, they face as they're looking to drive a digital transformation, as they're looking to reimagine uh, the business model of an organization. Mahesh was talking earlier on about that sort of shift from uh, the selling light bulbs to selling um, services and, and everything around that as well, and how that drove the change of the, you know, the workforce, the structure of the workforce, how they engage with, uh, with clients and internally as well. So uh, how, how do you particularly help uh, C-suite business leaders with those challenges? So. Uh, I think resistance to change is a fairly natural human reaction that, that people get comfortable uh, with what that what works for them and when they're pushed to change sometimes there is there is resistance I think what we found is that learning by example is critical so if you see other people reacting positively to the change you see other people able to adapt uh, it makes it easier to to help the people who feel greater resistance to see, oh, there is a path. Uh, we can give one example from our faculty that we had one faculty member who said, I absolutely cannot teach online. I only can teach in person. I do a great job. I don't want to mess it up by trying to teach online. And uh, he was pushed and nudged and encouraged, and he tried it. And he learned that he could teach just as well online as he could teach uh, in person. And furthermore, he became an advocate for online teaching. He started telling the other faculty, oh, I can teach online and it works well and here's how I did it and here's the tricks I learned. And so you got someone who was resistant to change to then becoming an advocate for change because they had been able to 
they were they had been coached around that corner, if you will. And so, so in some sense, showing people examples of of how the change can happen, uh, providing, and I think even all the way up to the C-suites, uh, they both have to they sometimes have to take the plunge and be the 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 uh, examples to show other, others that this change is possible. And I think we saw that, uh, for example, Mahesh talking about how he. Uh, changes the way he works, less travel, et cetera, uh, encourages everyone else to say, oh, if the CEO can do it, I can do it as well. And so uh, there has to be some encouragement, some nudging, some pushing, and then lots of examples of uh, that other people can follow. I think that came through very clearly from Mahash and, uh, and Uma as well, that leading from the front, demonstrating success and communicating that, uh, very important. Um, I wonder if I could just sort of shift attention a little bit because quite clearly in, in the paper and then in the follow-up poll that we just did, it seems that people are much more interested in uh, or talking about investing more in skills, training and development. But it might be that those uh, that, that training is going to have to change in some way. What do you hear from, from, from your clients and taking your clients to be organizations, to be uh, uh, people who take uh, executive education classes and, and, and so on? What, are you hearing anything in, in terms of the type of training and development um, that they want now? And, and has that changed somewhat uh, as a result of the uh, COVID crisis? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and, and there's no single uniform response. I mean, we have some clients who are resistant to change and they say, we only like in-person uh, workshops. We want in-person thing. Uh, executive education without the in-person touch is not uh, is not what we we believe in, and so we want to wait until uh, things open up more. We have others who say we embrace the change. We realize we have to go to more digital learning. We need to learn how to master the digital platforms, and we're willing to experiment. We're willing to try uh, digital learning, uh, digital classrooms, digital executive education, digital team team projects, and so uh, we we are probably spending more time with the leading thinkers in that space and saying, all right, we're gonna work with you, we'll run experiments with you, we'll figure out how to optimize that. And the ones who are more resistant, we'll, we'll have to show them the examples that we were able to be successful uh, with the companies that were more willing to, uh, to jump ahead. And I think there are quite a few players in both camps and, and, uh, and the ones that are willing to jump ahead, I think are gonna, are gonna move farther and faster uh, more quickly and uh, I'd encourage people to accept that the world has changed. Uh, it won't go completely back to the way it was. And, and you have to take the plunge at some point and say, we're willing to try these new platforms and these new ways of learning and growing. Yeah, again, it seems to sort of echo the comments that we had here with, uh, with my house and Anuma about um, realizing that, that things have changed, and that we need to move beyond the sort of firefighting to adopt into a new reality and shaping that new reality as well for the individual for the, for the company and making sure they're putting in place the, the type of structures in this case training development uh, that's going to be uh, required um, I, I, I wonder if i could take you back to some of the sort of specific skills and, uh, and attributes in our survey uh, and again just to remind everybody we did this we ran the survey just before the, uh, the crisis sort of broke um, we asked people what skills and attributes were, were most uh, valued. And um, on one of the charts uh, in the paper, the ability to work in virtual teams uh, was rated as, uh, as least important. Um, right. What else have you seen sort of change? What, what do you think is, in terms of skills and, develop, uh, and, and uh, attributes, what do you think are going to become more important uh, as we move forward over the coming months and years? So I think also just the willingness to adapt. The willingness to be flexible, right? So, so uh, COVID is was an unexpected crisis, uh, but it won't be the last one. And, and uh, I don't think many people will argue that that the rate of change in this world is going to slow down, and that uh, uh, people are, are, do need to to grow into feeling more comfortable with change, with experimentation, uh, with a willingness to try a new thing. So, so. Today, it's virtual teams, but tomorrow, maybe something else. And so uh, the, the most critical thing is to, is to uh, grow the organization as an organization that, that accepts uh, flexibility and adaptability and change 
as the norm. And so uh, if, if you grow the organization that way, then you get less resistance to change more generally. I mean, in our own organization, the Asia School of Business, we do a reorg roughly once a year. And, and people have gotten used to the fact that, all right, the, the organization is going to change again. We're going to restructure. We're going to uh, uh, shuffle up where people are working and what jobs they have. Not, not just for the sake of change, but for the sake of continuous improvement. But we, we learn something every year, and we want to, to maximize the benefit of that learning. We have to change the organization and change what some people do. And so just building that as a part of the culture, that change is part of our organizational life, uh, I think it is, is quite critical. One area that I'd like to explore a little bit with you, uh, Charles, before we move towards the end of the, this session. Um, we, we heard from Uma and Mahesh about the, the huge geographies that they uh, that they cover, right the way from Japan out to the Middle East, and Asia, Pacific, Africa, and, and so on. And you yourself, uh, MIT Sloan uh, 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 Professor uh, of Management there, uh, but now uh, in Asia, and you have, um, uh, from your vantage point there, you can look across the high growth markets traditionally of, of, of um, uh, China, uh, for example, uh, and Southeast Asia. And you've also got the, the more uh, conservative developed markets of places like Japan as well. Uh, given that sort of geographical um, spread that you, you have experience of, how, how do you see different places reacting uh, to the sort of needs of, uh, of this new normal? Well, so um, I think it, as you know, uh, it's important to recognize the variability and the variety <clears throat> of business cultures and business needs across geographies, right? So, so uh, Asia is clearly not uh, not one culture, uh, not one one uh, nation, uh, state. Uh, Asia is is highly diverse, and, uh, and and as the Asia School of Business, we we try to represent that diversity in our student body, our faculty, our curriculum, et cetera, and also being tightly connected with MIT, we sort of try to stay connected to the Western uh, side as well. I, I think uh, what's critical for businesses is to uh, learn and become familiar with, uh, with local cultures and local understanding. So I was talking to one bank president uh, uh, in one of the countries in Southeast Asia, and, and he said, we do business in 26 different countries, but all of our people are of the same nationality that is from our home country. Uh, and I asked him, well, how do you train people and prepare them to go work in these 26 different countries? And he said, well, we don't. We just send them and, and then they have to figure it out. And uh, I think we can do better than that. I think that we can prepare people to uh, work in these different countries. We can prepare people to understand differences in cultures uh, so that they they go in with a full set of tools when they move to a different country or culture, uh, and and they just have a, a much broader set in tool set. I think that's critical. Uh, that to recognize the diversity, not kind of try to homogenize in any way, shape, or form. It's it's really interesting, isn't it? Because diversity is a word that's come up quite repeatedly this morning we're talking about tech and, uh, and talent so so maybe it's naturally there but I, I'm quite um, surprised maybe encouraged at the uh, the amount that that word has, uh, has come out and maybe this also uh, uh, this experience that we've all gone through uh, helps us to realize that diversity can can really help us strengthen our organizations and bringing new thinking and help us uh, to become more resilient uh, more uh, uh, agile and, uh, and so on. Um, Charles, we've just got a, a few minutes left, so, so I wonder if I could just ask you for, for final comment. Is there anything in the paper that you've come across or the discussion uh, uh, that we've had this morning that's, that's really uh, stood out for you uh, in terms of this sort of um, uh, fundamental issue of building that future-ready workforce? Sure. So, so I think, first of all, we have to recognize the immensity of the challenge that, that businesses face, that, that uh, we can maybe put in simple adages uh, what's needed. We need uh, people with, with certain skills. We need people with uh, technological savvy. We need people, uh, we need diverse teams, et cetera. But saying it and doing it are two very different things. That, that the doing it is often hard work. I think both Mahesh and Uman, all, they talked about their great successes, uh, 
but on, but we can be sure that there's a huge amount of hard work and many years of laying the foundation to build the capabilities for their organizations to be successful uh, as they are. And, and so uh, this, I, I think uh, one of the observations has to be that even though these we, we, we are faced with very sharp turns, that is things change rapidly, uh, companies do have to play the long game. The play, play the long game means you have to be building and investing in capabilities uh, day in and day out, not just wait for the, when, oh, all of a sudden there's a storm and we have to prepare for the storm. Uh, you, in some sense, you need to be preparing over long periods, investing in your people, investing in, in capabilities, keeping an eye out for what, what the changes are that you're going to need to cope with and uh, building the resilience into organizations beforehand. So you can't decide overnight, oh, now we need to be diverse. Let's go hire a few to make a few diversity hires. It has to be a strategy over a, a long period. Um, Charles, thank you uh, very much uh, for those finding, uh, final thoughts. And I think um, exactly right to be focusing on that longer term and it takes time to build uh, the type of team that wants to start now and accelerate your, your activities, I think is something that's come across. Um, so Charles, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm, I'm just going to uh, uh, bring the, uh, the session to a close by, by wrapping up and um, uh, highlighting some of the points that we've looked at. And uh, as I look back over my notes again, I just mentioned diversity uh, as one of the big issues there. Um, uh, Uma, it struck me, um, uh, part, uh, not participation, but engagement, I think uh, uh, one of the uh, interesting there's for Mahesh, um, that whole issue of a business model transformation and what that means in, in, in bringing the workforce along and how you do that build borrow buy uh, and um, investing for the longer term as well and i guess in short this whole experience of the covid crisis has really um, uh, highlighted the need for that uh, resilience to, 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 have, to really understand your workforce as well and know where some of the stresses are. And we've learned that. We should be building on that. We should be making the appropriate decisions, uh, maybe arguing for more investment, maybe focusing a bit more time on training and development, uh, perhaps on mental health issues, recognizing the challenges that people might have uh, from uh, non-traditional working environments, i.e. Uh, working at home and so on. Uh, all of these issues, of course, we'll be coming back to um, uh, on our regular program at the Economist Corporate Network. These are themes that we look at uh, all the time. We're always very happy to hear from you, uh, our members, on this as well. Uh, hopefully, you can see a slide uh, on the screen as well, which uh, just uh, uh, directs you to uh, the paper, which, as I mentioned, was uh, sponsored by uh, Asia School of Business and is available for uh, download uh, from today. There will be some smaller uh, sessions taking place in Tokyo, Seoul and Shanghai uh, in the coming couple of weeks as well to discuss these uh, issues with a much more sort of local uh, uh, flavour as well. Uh, and uh, finally, just before uh, we wrap up, I should um, note that we have a, one more event today. So it's a bumper day for, for ECN members. We have a session looking at navigating the new Cold War. So a complete change of gears, or maybe not completely because technology uh, is a major component of, uh, of all of this. So we have um, uh, Dr. Alan Dupont, He's a research fellow at the Heinrich Foundation. Uh, he's just released a new paper looking at uh, mitigating the new Cold War, US-China trade and technology. Uh, Dane Kamuro, uh, who's a partner uh, for Asia Pacific at Control Risks, and, and John Penrice, president uh, at Asia Pacific of Dow uh, Chemical. Uh, and that's uh, four o'clock this afternoon. It's a Zoom meeting um, uh, uh, at Singapore time. Um, so finally, with that, um, I'd just like to thank all of you for, for joining us this morning, for investing a, a little bit of time with us to talk about these issues around uh, talent, tech uh, and technology. Uh, and in particular, thanking our guests uh, uh, today, uh, Mahesh and Uma, for coming in on this terrible rainy day uh, in Singapore to share some thoughts. So thank you very much indeed. And I wish you every success with your business. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I'll draw the meeting to a close. Thank you very much. Goodbye.